can play Murdanga. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Mr. Murdanga. Who? I know. That's that's for sure, no problem. <laughs> Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihahina Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihahina Jaya Gopi Janavallama Garivara Dahi Jaya Gopi Jaya Gopi Janavallama Garivara Dahi Jaya Gopi Nandana Braja Janar Hanjanayas Jasod Nandana Braja Janar Hanjanayas Jamun Tira Hana Kahan Jamun Tira Hare Jamun Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Kunja Bihari Jai Kopi Janavallava Jai Radha Kopi Janavala Yeri Vardha Yeri Vardha Yeri Vardha Yeri Vardha Yeri Vardha Yeri Yasodanandana Rajajanandaya Jamunatira Hane Jahiyam Jamunatira Hane Jahiyam Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Om Vishnu Pad Paramahans Pariva Chaka Charja Astotra Sattva Shri Sriman His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai 
आज ग्रंथ श्रीमद भगवतम की जाए श्री गुरु पूर्णिमा की जाए श्री व्यास देव की जाए सनातन गोस्वामी स्थिर भाव की जाए द बिगिनिंग ऑफ चतुर्मासीय की जाए नो मोर स्पिनिच फॉर वन मंथ की जाए ऑल ग्लोरीज टू द असेंबल डिवोटीज ऑल ग्लोरीज टू द असेंबल डिवोटीज ऑल ग्लोरीज टू द असेंबल डिवोटीज ऑल ग्लोरीज टू श्री गुरु एंड श्री गोरंगा Sorry about that one. <laughs> Beginning of Chapter Masya, Shri Prabhupada has written one statement. It's actually it's in the Shka Shastras, where he mentions in one point we should observe the Chapter Masya, which begins today for four months, and each month there's a particular food that we uh, fast from, and that is. The first month is spinach. The second month is yogurt. The third month is milk. The fourth month, fourth month, which is the last one, which is kartik, is urdal. So <clears throat> sometimes <clears throat> we overlook this particular instruction, but it is an instruction by Prabhupada. You can find it in the in the uh, Bhagavatam. He he mentions that. So no spinajo. Okay. So, uh, little things that I notice, and I feel like I should say something. And one of the things that I think is important is Mangalarti. Mangalarti is not rock and roll. It's uh, it's supposed to be done very softly with one karto and a very soft mridanga. The song and the singing is very sweet. Krishna is in Vrindavan. Krishna has been sneaking out all night with Radharani, and now he, in order not to get caught with Radharani, he sneaks back into bed, <laughs> and so he's sleeping. And now Mangalarti is waking him up for the second time. <laughs> so this Mangalarti is done very, very softly and very, very sweetly, and he, as the kirtan increases and then the maha mantra increases. Gradually, the temple can increase, but this witness should never be lost. It's not about loud mardangas or loud kartans. It's very soft, and very sweet, and you're actually well. You're waking up Krishna and Radharani. So this is a very the mood of Mangalarti is like that. So we, it's been adopted in many temples around the world. This very sweet, soft Mangalarti, and you find yourself. Just getting absorbed more in the sound of the name, rather than the the musical accompaniment. There's something is there, but it's almost like a cappella, <laughs> almost, but not quite. A cappella means no no instruments at all, but just voices very softly and swing it. And when it's done together, it's so really beautiful, and that's the mood of Mangalarti. And in the end, you can get a little faster and like that, but it's not like you know, uh, really high energy kirtan. And the second thing, which is a little incidental thing, is that garlands from the day before, if you keep them out, it increases in the inhabitants that are found in the garlands. So it's recommended that. Once you remove Prabhupada's garland, put it in the refrigerator or cool, and then bring it out for the speaker the next day. Otherwise, it gets full of bugs. That's why we take off the garlands real fast because we're feeling ecstatic symptoms from bugs association. <laughs> so, <laughs> it happens all the time, and some of us are allergic to bugs, like me. So. So flowers, especially in the in the warm weather, they attract bugs. So it's better to keep it in the refrigerator and then give it to the speaker the next day. Like that. Unless you make fresh garlands the first day, then you can, you know. But ones that are kept overnight should be cooled so they're not, uh, you know, infested with other living entities. We have nothing against them chewing on the flowers. That's okay. They gain great spiritual benefit from that. <laughs> But 
Okay, so anyway, that's a little bit about Garland philosophy. <laughs> so, so just so you know, it's important to know these things, uh, the basic things. <laughs> okay, so today is Guru Purnima. It is the full moon. <clears throat> and it is also the disappearance day of Srila Sanatan Goswami. And also the uh, celebration for Guru Purnima refers to Vyasadeva. <laughs> who is the author of Srimad Bhagavatam, or at least he is the transcriber of Srimad Bhagavatam. So we honor <clears throat> these two personalities today as, uh, as, the, uh, as the festival of Guru Purnima. So we'll speak a little bit about each of them, <clears throat> but first we'll do the verse in the Bhagavatam. So this is Canto 10, Chapter 4, Text number 29, The Atrocities of King Kamsa, verse 28. I'm sorry, not 29. <clears throat> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Sri Sukha Uvacha Kamsa Evam Prasanabhyam 29? Oh, I see. Okay. We'll do 28 and 29 today, yeah, okay. Tasyam Bratriam Vatitayam Kamsa Ahuya Mantrinaha Tebya Akyasta Tatsarvam Yad yuktam yoga nidrayaha nidraya tasyam ratrimyam atitayam kamsa mahuya matrinaha tebya makasta tat sarvam Yad yuktam yoga nidraya tasyam ratrim yam vatitayam kamsa mahuya matrinaha tebya machasta tat sarvam yad yuktam yoga nidraya
<coughs> tasyam that ratriyam night vyati tayam having passed kamsa king kamsa ahuya calling for matrina all the ministers tebya them achasta informed tat that sarvam all yat yuktam that which was spoken that kamsa that kamsa's murderer was already somewhere else yoga nidraya by yoga maya the goddess durga so i'll read verse 28 sukadev goswami continued thus having been addressed in purity by devaki and vasudev who were very much appeased kamsa felt pleased and with their permission he entered his home text 29 after that night passed kamsa summoned his ministers and informed them that all that had been spoken by yogamaya who had revealed that he who was to be slain kamsa had already been born somewhere else purport the vedic scriptures chandi vedic scripture chandi describes maya the energy of the supreme lord as nidra durga devi sarva bhuteshu nidra rupena samastitaha the energy of yoga maya and mahamaya keeps the living entity sleeping in this material world in great darkness of ignorance yoga maya the goddess of durga kept Kamsa in darkness about Krishna's birth and misled him to believe that his enemy Krishna had been born elsewhere. Krishna was born the son of Devaki, but according to the Lord's original plan, as prophesied by Brahma, he went to Vrindavan to give pleasure to Mother Yasoda and Nanda Maharaj and other intimate friends and devotees for 11 years. Then he would return to kill Kamsa, because Kamsa did not know this, he believed Yogamaya's statement that Kramsa was born elsewhere, not to Devaki. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Ginajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Guravena Maha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pracharine Nirvishesa Sinyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nithananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaudavakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So, hmm. Kamsa feels a little more peaceful now, but still, his peacefulness will last a few moments. And now he's again becoming agitated, and now he's summoning his ministers. He wants to do something to stop Krishna. There's an old say, Rake Krishna More Ke, More Krishna Rake Ke. Mm -hmm. This is a very important. Rake Krishna More Ke, More Krishna Rake Ke. If Krishna wants to kill you, you're dead. <laughs> and if Krishna wants to save you, nobody can kill you. <laughs> so that's good news for the devotees. Krishna always protects his devotees, so no one can kill you as long as you remember Krishna. <laughs> so when we stay fixed in Krishna consciousness, we're always protected from all dangers in the material world and from all allurements by the material energy. So Krishna is the full 
protector, but he's death personified to those who are envious and atheistic. And for Kamsa, he's so powerful. He, he, he has destroyed so many demons in the past. Just like we read how so many demons came to kill Krishna when Krishna was in Vrindavan on the order of Kamsa. How did they come to obey Kamsa? Kamsa had defeated all these demons. That's mentioned in the Garga Samhita, how he, he was so powerful that all these mystic demons that were sent and killed by Krishna and sent by Kamsa were also defeated first and therefore they became the servant of Kamsa and Kamsa used them to try to kill Krishna. <laughs> but of course now Kamsa is worried <clears throat> because in his last life he was killed by Krishna as Kalanami, and uh, he was killed by uh, the uh, Nisringadev, I think it was, when uh, in a previous life, uh, Rani Kashipu had one general named Kalanami, and Kalanami was a uh, uh, follower of Rani Kashipu, and so he was also killed by Lord Nisringadev. When Lord Nisringadev killed Rani Kashipu, he killed so many of his soldiers. So he knew the prophecy that he had been killed by Krishna in a different form in a previous life, and now that same person was coming to get him again. <laughs> and so now he's making all arrangements. And he, he performs so many heinous acts. He sends his ministers and his demons around to kill children everywhere. Anyone that has been born within the last 10 days, this was his dictum to kill them. You see how cruel Kams is. Prabhupada says the demons will do anything. <laughs> anything. <laughs> and that word is not minimized in any way. They'll do whatever they can to preserve whatever they want to preserve, either their life or their possessions. So in the world today, we see there's, there are demons who will do anything. <laughs> They'll kill their own parents if they have to. This is how ruthless and cruel a demon is. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 16th chapter, Krishna very uh, completely or with great detail describes the nature of demons. So much power I have today and so much more I will gain in the future. He is my enemy and I have killed him and my, enemy, my other enemy will also be killed. I am surrounded by so many relatives. I am wealthy, I am prestigious, I am powerful. I am happy and I will give in charity and I will rejoice. Mm -hmm. So this, that verse, two verses is actually from the Gita. Explaining what is the nature of the mind of the demons like that. And so they will do anything. They'll start wars just to fulfill their own desires. Just like today, sometimes we wonder why there's so many wars. People don't want wars, but it's behind the scenes. It's these big demons who are instituting or organizing all these fratricidals. Putting people like, just like in India. The British tried to control the Indian population, but they couldn't do it. So in order to do that, they created en enmity between the Muslims and the Hindus in India and had them fighting amongst each other. <laughs> so the British instituted the hatred amongst Hindus and Muslims. Before there wasn't, they lived peacefully together. And they were like, of course, they had practiced their own religion separately, but they were no enmity. So the British were trying to control the Indian population. They couldn't do it. So they did it by uh, creating this uh, situation where Hindus and Muslims would start hating each other. And they did it through political maneuvering like that. So... This is how people, big people work. 
they, in order to control populations, they, cre they create enmity amongst others, and therefore they can benefit by either control through exploitation and through what we say, uh, using, getting the wealth from different lands by intervening in different ways. So this is today's politics, it goes on every moment. Don't read the paper, take my word for it, it's true. <laughs> So Kamsa is like that. Kamsa, he's now he's worried and he's thinking what to do. And so he's making his devious plans. It says here, Krishna was born else was born of Devaki. But that is partially correct. Prabhupada is not making a misstatement. Krishna was born in two places at the same time. He appeared as Vrindavan Krishna in the cowherd village of Mother Yasoda Nanda Maharaj. And he appeared in the jail cell of Kamsa as Vaikuntha Krishna, the son of Devaki. Simultaneously, he took birth in two different places. But Mother Yasoda during her child growth, she was overwhelmed and she lost consciousness and she fell asleep. And she only thought she had a girl. So it was actually a boy and a girl that were born together of, of, Nanda, of Mother Yasoda. And, but that boy wasn't visible. <laughs> so when uh, Vasudeva was trying to save Vaikuntha Krishna from the hands of Kamsa, he snuck out that night with the, the baby, went through the Jamuna River, arrived in Vrindavan, and placed the baby down there, and then took the girl, who was Yogamaya, back to the jail cell. But what happened was that the two Krishnas merged into one. So Vrindavan Krishna and, Vrinda and Vaikuntha Krishna became one Krishna, Krishna Vrindavan. That's why when Kamsa sent so many demons, Krishna killed them because Krishna in Vrindavan does not kill demons. But the Krishna of Vaikuntha, who is a manifestation of the Narayan feature, is found with four weapons, the chakra, and the mace, the lotus flower, and the conch. So he is geared to kill. So when Krishna was being attacked in Vrindavan, it was the Vaikuntha Krishna inside of the Vrindavan Krishna. One Krishna had become, two Krishnas had become one, who was killing the demons. Interesting. And then when Krishna had to leave to go to Mathura to kill Kamsa, which happened 11 years later. The two Krishnas again separated, and the Vaikuntha Krishna left Vrindavan to go to Mathura, but the Vrindavan Krishna, as it says in the Shastras, Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. So he was still there, but he was unmanifested. He was in his form of Vipralambhabhav, which means he was in the form of loving him in separation. So he was there, but he was not manifested. So, but he never leaves Vrindavan. So this is interesting how Krishna does things. He uses his powers to bewilder everyone like that. Just like you look at the deity, Radha and Krishna, and you think they're just standing there. They're not, they're doing things. You can't see that. They're actually doing things, and they're not just standing in one position. They're actually having their pastimes right there. And Prabhupada was giving darshan one time to one very respectable Indian gentleman. He says, and the Indian gentleman says, you know, he was looking, and Prabhupada said, you cannot see because you, have not, you haven't developed pure vision, but they are having their pastimes right there. <laughs> So when you have purified eyes, Premanjaritam Bhakti Valochanena Santasa Daiva Ridayeshu Vilokayanti, 
yam shyama sundar chinta guna sarupam gauvindam aripurusham tamaham bhajami when we have pure love then we can see krishna <laughs> Then we can see Krishna. But in the meantime, Krishna appears in his deity form, and we get a glimpse of that Krishna. So he's there, and he's not just standing there holding a flute. He's doing many things. <laughs> we can't see that because of our eyes are not pure enough. But when we develop transcendental vision, which comes by chanting the holy names, as we continue to chant the holy names, our heart, becomes purified and our eyes develop what is called love. We see with love and then when you see with love you see. So this is the process of Krishna consciousness. Now today is the disappearance day of Srila Sanatana Goswami Bande Rupa Sanatana Bhagu Yago. Sri Jiva Gopalako. The six Goswamis of Vrindavan, who are the direct disciples of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who have come to this world to give the teachings of Lord Chaitanya in many, many different Shastric forms. They, there, they were there to excavate holy places, build temples, and to translate and to present transcendental knowledge. So Sanatana Goswami, he's an author of Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. What is Brihad Bhagavatam Rita? Srimad Bhagavatam was spoken by Sukadeva Goswami to Maharaj Pariksit. Maharaj Pariksit was cursed to die within seven days, to be bitten by a snake bird, and uh, he accepted the curse, but he also came to the banks of the Jamuna River and sat there and listened for seven full days on the teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam. Sukadeva Goswami read, then spoke, spoke Srimad Bhagavatam, didn't read it, he spoke it for seven full days. After the seven days were over, Maharaj Pariksit, absorbing himself in the leelas of Krishna, became fully self-realized. He was now ready to meet his destiny and leave his body. He was on his way to meditate and wait for his destiny to manifest. His mother, Uttara, came running up to him. She said, son, son, I am your mother. Please tell me what Sukadeva Goswami has given to you. I want to learn also. I want to get the, I want to hear about Bhagavatam. He said, Mother, I don't have time. <laughs> it's time is short. <laughs> but I will give you something. And so he narrated Brihat Bhagavatam Rita, which is beautiful Shastras. If you haven't read it, please do. There's three volumes available. It's the, it's the sweet essence of Srimad Bhagavatam given by Sanatana Goswami. So it was narrated by Raha Pariksit and then put in scripture form by Srila Sanatana Goswami. So this is one of the more powerful scriptures. Sanatana Goswami and Rupa Goswami were ministers under the Nahab. And they were forced to serve the Islamic government. Why were they forced? The Islamic government at that time were threatening the Hindu populations that if you do not, um, you know, come and assist me, then I will exploit the Hindu population. So in order to save the Hindus from being exploited by the Muslim leader, Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami were Saraswat Brahmins. They were of the highest form of Brahmin caste. And to do that service would have been a complete degradation. They would lose their caste, they would lose everything. But they did it simply to protect the Hindu community. And so they accepted that. And they were the best of ministers. Rupa Goswami was the treasurer, Sanatana Goswami was the advisor of the, the Nawab. 
And he did his service in such a way that the Nawab could even trust him to lead the government when he would go away. He, he, he adopted Sanatana Goswami as his own son. And of course they changed their names. Dabik, Dabir Kash and Sadak Muluk. They adopted Islamic titles like that. They gave up their actual names. You can go in the area of East Bengal, which is Bangladesh now, and today, and you can see the birthplace of Rupaga and Sanatan Goswami. They were brothers. And Jiva Goswami was the, there was a third brother called Anupam, and he had a son who later became Jiva Goswami. So it was three brothers and the nephew Jiva Goswami. Now, when Mahaprabhu left Jagannath Puri to go to Vrindavan, he stopped at Ramakali. And while he was at Ramakali, Sanatana Goswami and Rupa Goswami, and also little Jiva came. Jiva was only a young boy, a seven years old. They came to see Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it's a beautiful narration in the Chaitanya Charitamrita of the exchange between uh, Lord Chaitanya and Sanatan Rupa Goswami. They offer their prayers, they humble obeisances and glorifying Lord Chaitanya. But before departing, Lord Chaitanya told them, get free from your government service and come and join me. I need you. I have some service for both of you. So, and then Lord Chaitanya left. So they were thinking how to do that. And so after Lord Chaitanya went to Benares and he went to the house of Kashi Mishra, he stayed there. Then Sanatana Goswami and Rupa Goswami took the advantage. And Sanatana Goswami called in sick one day. We do that today, right? We want a day off. <laughs> he called in sick and said, I'm not able to come today. And the Nawab said, fine. But what he did is he went to see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And no, you know, he didn't go to Satan. He went, he went, he went to his home, and there he was hearing Srimad Bhagavatam and reading Srimad Bhagavatam. So this went on for days. He had no intention to return. The Nawab became very upset. Where is Sanatan? And he went looking for him. Finally, he came to his place and found Sanatan. Sanatan was simply absorbed in Bhagavatam. He, he treated Sanatan like his own son, so he was very affectionate. He said, your older brother, he wants to go out and exploit other living entities. I need you to manage the kingdom. So what are you doing? He said, you cannot count on my services anymore. <laughs> Nawa became very angry and ordered his guards to put Sanatan Goswami in jail. So he was placed in prison, like that, in chains. So the Nawa became very angry and left. Rupa Goswami had also left, and they had become so rich during the time that they had they were uh, in government service that they had amassed enough gold coins to fill two big boats. <laughs> two big boats. Now, Rupa Goswami, when he left, he took all that wealth and he divided it into four categories. He took 50% and gave it to the Hare Krishnas, <laughs> you might say. In other words, he used it for religious principles. He took 25% and put it in the bank for savings. And he used the other 25% for personal needs and expenses like that. Prabhupada said, this is what the required householders in our ISKCON movement should follow Rupa Goswami's example. <laughs> it's like banging your head against the wall. But anyway, <laughs> he said, this is how we should use our wealth. We take 50% of our gross income, not net, gross income and divide it, give 50% to the Hare Krishnas or some, some religious uh, movement. Best, best to give it to Hare Krishnas because they're poor. And the other 
you bank 25%, you keep 25% in for your personal needs. So, Sanatana Goswami sent word to Rupa Goswami that I'm in jail. Can you send some gold coins? I need to get out. So he sent 10,000 gold coins with a one. Do you remember how that money got there? I can't remember how the money got to Sanatana Goswami. Someone brought it. I think it was Ishan. Yeah, Ishan. Ishan was a servant of Rupa Goswami, and he brought the 10,000 gold coins and gave it to him while he was in jail. <coughs> so then Sanatana Goswami told the jailer that, you know, you know, you're a very intelligent person. He was a Muslim with a big beard. And he told him, you're a very intelligent person. You're very aristocratic. Actually, you know, why are you keeping me punished? I want to go to Mecca and worship the Lord. So please free me. He said, I can't do that. They'll punish me. I will offer you 5,000 gold coins. So he said, this is very tempting, but still I cannot do it. So then Sanatana Goswami said, all right, I will give you, he gave him all but eight gold coins. He gave him all, almost 10,000, he kept eight back and he said, I will give you 10,000. The Muslim jailer said, I think we can do this one. <laughs> So he said, but how will we do this? He said, you take me down to the banks of the river and you say that I had to take care of nature and I jumped into the river with my chains on and I was washed away. So that was the plan. And so he gave him the coins and he freed him and then he connected with Ishan. And now he's in rags and he's going to travel to meet Lord Chaitanya who's in Benares. Now he's with Ishana. And while he has eight gold coins, so Sanatana Goswami said, you know, these eight gold coins are a death now. You know, at any time we're passing through dangerous areas, robbers will attack us, kill us, and take those. So give those gold coins away. But he didn't. He kept them. So they came to one area where there was a uh, a uh, hotel keeper who was an astrologer who used dacoits to check on travelers coming in the area and see if they had some wealth. So they reported back to him, yeah, there is two travelers and they have gold coins. So he sent out his men and he... he uh, Nicely invited, uh, I think this is the actual, uh, uh, Sanatana Goswami to stay at the hotel, so he did. At night, the hotel owner was going to kill him, and he could understand that. So he went to the hotel owner and said, here, here are the gold coins. And he said, he gave him all but, he gave him seven, because Ishana kept one gold coin back. He wanted to keep something. So he gave him seven. And the hotel owner said, I was about to kill you for these gold coins, but you're giving to me. You're such an honest person. No, you keep them. And this is how, and he responded that way. And then Sanatana Goswami said, if you don't kill me for it, somebody else will. So you better take it. So he gave him the seven gold coins. And then the hotel owner arranged for him to travel without any disturbance. But then he could understand there was one more gold coin Ishana had. So he told Ishana, you want to keep that gold coin, you cannot travel with me, so you go. So he gave him that one coin and he left and he traveled alone through the forest. And while he was in the forest, he didn't have anything. He was a long journey from where he was to go to Lord Chaitanya. He didn't have anything. And so he was trying to live on fruits and roots and whatever he could find. And one time he drank some water, which was bad water. 
and he got all these sores all over his body. Prabhupada said they were oozing sores, itchy oozing sores. Prabhupada says there's dry sores and there's wet sores. These were wet and they were oozing various types of foul substances. And it made his body not very, you know, it wasn't like a perfume shop. It was kind of like the opposite. And so he was going through, finally, he came close to Benares and he came to the house of Kashi Vishnu where, where Lord Chaitanya was staying. Now he's raggedy, he has long hair, his body is full of sores, and he, you know, he's got uh, raggedy clothes on. Hmm. Okay, there's one point here. We'll get to that one. So he sits at the door. Now, Lord Chaitanya, who's the indwelling super soul in, every, in the hearts of all living entities, says to his servant, there's someone at the door, please let him in. So the man goes to the door and opens the door and he sees this person sitting there. He comes back, he says, there's nobody there but a Muslim mendicant. <laughs> no, Lord Chaitanya said, that is Sanatan, let him in. So he went in and he, reluctantly because he was his body was full of sores. When Lord Chaitanya saw him, he was so happy that he ran and embraced him. And when he did, all the sores touched the body of Lord Chaitanya and all that liquid was on his body. But it says that Lord Chaitanya was seeing those that oozing sores as Chitushyana. This is a very fragrant uh, a condiment that people use to make the body smell nice. It's very fragrant. It's a combination of different things like musk and sandalwood and like that. So Lord Chaitanya wasn't seeing him in the way one would see him. He was seeing him, here's a great devotee. And so when he embraced him, all his sores were gone. And then there was a beautiful exchange. But Lord Chaitanya was a little unhappy. He said, you look like Dharavesh. <laughs> now Prabhupada chants, translates the word Dharavesh as hippie. Because he had long hair. So he said, you know, I think it's time to shave up. <laughs> so he told Sanatan Goswami, go get clean. Now, when Sanatana Goswami was traveling, he met his cousin, Srikant. And Srikant gave Sanatana Goswami a blanket. And the blanket was very costly and precious. Lord Chaitanya was looking at that blanket like, this is not for you. So he could understand Lord Chaitanya was not pleased with the blanket. So when he left, he went and he found this man who was sitting on the side of the road who had an old toy cloth for a cover. And he said, my dear sir, I would like to trade my blanket for your cloth. The man said, you are insulting me. You're insulting me. How can you say that? My cloth is nothing, just full of holes and dirt. And you have this valuable cloth. He said, no, no. Actually, this is the instructions of my spiritual master. He wants me to, to exchange this blanket for something simple. So the man exchanged it. And then he came back and he had uh, cleaned up. And Lord Chaitanya said, now all your material attachments are gone. Because <laughs> that, that one blanket was his material attachment. Like that. So, and then of course... From then he joined Lord Chaitanya and Lord Chaitanya gave him instructions uh, to about writing books and going to holy places and finding Krishna's pastime places like that. Um, he came in contact with one, one, one deity called Madan Mohan. There's a famous temple in Vrindavan called Madan Mohan Mandir. It's the most noticeable temple in Vrindavan. It's big, it has a cone shape. You've seen it, if you've seen pictures of her. 
Vrindavan. That's the Madan Mohan Mandir in Sri Vrindavan Dam, erected by Sanatan Goswami under the auspices of, of, of some people who came forward to construct the temple for Madan Mohan like that. There's a story how he used to take care of Madan Mohan before he had the temple. He would keep the deity in the tree. And Sanatana Goswami would live very simply. He would, he would go and find some chapati flour, mix it with Ganji, Ganges water, and make some chapatis. And then he would offer it to Madan Mohan, who was in the tree. <laughs> He had his deity in the tree because he didn't have anything. And uh, so one day, Madan Mohan said to Sanatan, he talked to him, You're giving me chapati, no ghee? <laughs> you're just, oh no, you're giving me chapati, no salt? <laughs> that's, uh, that's what he said, no salt. And Sanatana Goswami said, you're going to have to accept what I got because I don't have anything. And if I start giving you salt, then you're going to want ghee. <laughs> so this was the exchange between the Lord and his devotee. A loving exchange like that. So Madan said, Madan Mohan went, said, okay. <laughs> In other words, he didn't protest. He accepted the simple, but then... Sanatana so Goswami wanted something nice, so one very rich man came forward, was very attracted to Sanatana and offered some service, and Sanatana engaged him in building a temple for Madan Mohan. So that's a beautiful temple in Vrindavan. So Sanatana Goswami, today is his disappearance day. It's, he's one of the six Goswamis of Vrindavan. Vande Rupa Sanatano Ragu Yago Sri Jiva Gopal Ko. They are very renounced. Don't try to imitate the Rupa, the Goswamis of Vrindavan. It's not possible to imitate them. They live completely on practically nothing. And they were chanting twenty four hours a day, writing books and working very hard. It's not that they sat down. They were chanting, writing, and, fi and also arranging for holy places to be found. One time, it was Sanatana Goswami's birthday, and Srila Rupa Goswami was there in the hut, and he wanted to make a nice offering to his, his big brother, his older brother, and so he was thinking, I'd like to offer something nice to Sanatan, but I, we don't have anything. So knowing his mind, a very beautiful little girl came and said, knocked on his door of his hut. He was in a little hut. Said, hey, Baba, I have some extra, some extra milk, some extra rice, some extra sugar. It's for you. You please take. So he was amazed to see the girl. She was so charming. Little girl, so beautiful. So he immediately took everything, and then the girl left. And then he prepared a nice feast of sweet rice for his uh, brother. And that evening, he brought it to him for his appearance day. So Sanatana Goswami was very happy. But then, when he was eating the sweet rice, he realized something wasn't right. He said, you know, we have nothing. Where did you get this from? And then, because when he tasted the sweet rice, it was like from another planet. It was celestial. It was so nice. I mean, if you've tasted sweet rice in Iskon, that's nice. But there are higher and higher forms of sweet rice. That you, I think, he, didn't you used to cook sweet rice at one time? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it becomes so creamy and so, that when you start eating it, you think, I've entered into the spiritual world. <laughs> Experience is so nice. So we should try to make sweet rice like that. 
very, very nice. Because Prabhupada likes and Krishna likes sweet rice. So, tasting this most amazing taste, he questioned Rupa Goswami. He said, he said, where did you get this? He said, well, there was some young girl who came and she gave the ingredients. He said, can you please describe that girl? And then he, as he was describing, Sanatana Goswami said, oh, this is not good. You have taken service from Srimati Radharani. We are here to give service to Srimati Radharani. We are not here to take service from Srimati Radharani. So Rupa Goswami didn't do anything wrong, but Sanatana Goswami wanted to explain that we're not here to take service from God. We're here to give service to God. But the thing is, in Krishna consciousness, when you serve the Lord, the Lord, what, is it, what does he do? He figures out ways to serve you. He does things in your life, and you wonder how they're happening. But it's him. He's arranging it all. You can't see it. So it's like, oh, if I serve the Lord, what will happen to me? Sometimes we think that I have to give up things. No, you actually, when you serve the Lord, and the Lord is pleased, the Lord becomes so inclined to do something for his devotee to make his devotee happy. This is the Lord. It's not one way. It's always Krishna, always also. And Prabhupada used to say, using the example of his father, he said, what can you give to Krishna that he's holding with ten hands? What can you give with two hands that he, he's holding with ten? And what can you hold in two hands that he's taking away with ten? <laughs> So Krishna always, in other words, Krishna can serve you better than you can serve you, him. He's always superior in his service. So there's never any loss when we serve Krishna. Mm -hmm. Krishna takes care of his devotees beyond the devotee's imagination. And so, but the still, Sanatana Goswami wanted to make the point, we don't take service from God like that. So that's a nice story. Another time, um, Rupa Goswami was writing a description of Srimati Radharani. And he was describing her beautiful braid that goes down from the top of her head down her back. She has a long braid. And in that braid, he compared the braid of Radharani to a beautiful black snake. Now he showed the writing to Sanatan, and Sanatan said, What is this? You're comparing Radharani's braid to a snake, black snake? This is not right. So he, he mildly chastised them. And then Rupa Goswami didn't say anything. So a little later on, Sanatana Goswami was there in Vrindavan. He saw some young girls, and they were playing together, three young girls. And then what he thought was a snake was climbing up the back of one of the young girls, and he just said, be careful, girls, there's a snake, there's a snake, there's a snake. And all the girls turned around, started to laugh, and they disappeared, and the whole scene just disappeared. <laughs> So it was actually Radharani wanted to say, yes, Rupa Goswami has given a nice description <laughs> like that. So when he saw that, then he realized what Rupa Goswami was saying was correct, actually. There was no snake. <laughs> it was just the beautiful hair of Radharani like that. So, so these are some beautiful pastimes of Sanatana Goswami. Sanatana Goswami is known for his humility. Um, it says that there's four persons you can't imitate. Sanatana Goswami, Haridas Thakur. Um, who's the, let me see, the other one is uh, 
Ramananda, was it Ramananda Roy? Yeah, Ramananda Roy, uh, and one more, Damodar Pandit. Okay. These four persons have a certain characteristic that's outstanding that no one should try to imitate. Damodar Pandit used to correct the Lord. <laughs> when the Lord, in his role as sannyas, would do something, Damodar would sometimes say, you're not following the proper etiquette. <laughs> you're not behaving properly. So sometimes the Lord would, would accept that and change. So nobody else could do that with Damodar Pandit, but sometimes the Lord would get a little disturbed with Damodar. But no one else would dare to do that. <laughs> And then um, Ramananda Roy, he had the service of teaching and massaging the girls who danced for Jagannath. They were called Devi Dasis. And in order to prepare them for, for, for their dance for Jagannath, he would massage their bodies with oil. And it says his mind was like stone. He wasn't the slightest bit disturbed. He was in his mood of a gopi massaging other gopis in the spiritual world. Don't try that. <laughs> Don't try that. I mean, sometimes people try different things. And then the other one was um, Srila Haridas Dakur. He is known for his tolerance. When the prostitute came to tempt him, he just said, I'm busy, I have so many rounds to chant. So if you chant with me after we finish our rounds, then I will satisfy all your desires. And she was the most attractive and most popular po prostitute of the area. She was high price. That's what they said. <laughs> And she could attempt anyone, but when Haridas Thakur, his mind was in slightly, even slightly disturbed. And he would just chant and chant and chant, so much so that after three days, she became a devotee and started to chant Hare Krishna. He actually made this very prestigious prostitute, and she was quite wealthy and very popular. He turned her into a a devotee, and then she was also chanting like Haridas Thakur, let's mention. One, I don't know if I should say this. I'll tell you later, this is not so good. This is a kind of a side story. It's a Niskan pastime. Somebody tried that, to imitate Haridas. You don't try to imitate Haridas Thakur. Okay. And the last one is Sanatana Goswami's humility. His humility cannot be imitated. When Sanatana Goswami would want to go see Lord Chaitanya, he would have to pass through the Jagannath temple. And he felt himself so unqualified to be seen in public by these pujaris who take care of Jagannath, Jagannath's intimate associates that he would avoid going that direction because the Pujaris were always in and out of the temples. So in one time when he went to go see um, Lord Chaitanya, he didn't take that route, he took the route by the beach, which was the only other route. And this was in Jaist. Jaist is, is July, it's this month. And the sands on the beach are burning hot. So in order to see Lord Chaitanya, he went across these sands and his feet were being burnt by the sand, blazing hot sand. When he came, he fell at the feet of Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya noticed his feet were full of blisters. He said, which way did you come? How did you get here? Your feet are all burnt. What happened? And then he didn't say anything. But then finally he said, I took the path by the beach. Why? Because I was afraid of contaminating the Pujaris if they would see me. This was his humility. 
So this is an example of his humility. He was so humble. And Prabhupada says, or actually the Shastras say, one should not try to imitate the humility of Sanatana Goswami. He was humility personified. So these are some of the stories of Srila Sanatana Goswami. Today is also the appearance day, which we celebrate as Guru Purnima. It is the appearance of Vyasadeva, who is the author of Srimad Bhagavatam. He is not the author. He has taken the Vedanta Sutras, which were the Brahma Sutras, the Bra Brahma Sutras to the Vedanta Sutras, and he's translated them because the Vedanta Sutras are in codes, and one cannot understand them. So he's unraveled the codes and presented it in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. And Bhagavatam is the pure Puran. It's called Amalam Purana. In this scripture, there is no uh, uh, incentive for anything but pure devotional service. In other words, there is no karma, no gyan, no yoga. In other words, only Bhagavatam is pure devotional service to Krishna. Ayabhya sita sunya jnana kama anavritam anukulena krishna silanam bhakti uttama it is pure scripture. It is meant only for devotion to Krishna, like that. I see some of you are really relaxed. <laughs> and some of you are not only really relaxed, but really, really relaxed. <laughs> we have one over there. Is that a meditation? <laughs> or... Keshava. What are you meditating on? <laughs> okay. So Prabhupada, when Prabhupada was giving a class and people would fall asleep, he would immediately wake them up and say, sleep 13 hours, but don't sleep in class. And there's one statement like that. So Bhagavatam is not a place for sleeping. Why? Because you're sending a message that this class is useless, and therefore, we should all do the same thing I'm doing. <laughs> In other words, you're broadcasting. So please try to stay awake. It's important. Even though the speaker is not so qualified, the message is. The message is Bhagavatam. So we're trying to present pure Bhagavatam according to Prabhupada's direction. So therefore, it's very important that we... Sutta Goswami spoke the teachings of Bhagavatam to 88,000 sages, and he didn't have a microphone. And there's no record of anybody falling asleep either. So 88,000 people listened to Sutta, Sutta Goswami at Nami Sharanya, one of the most holiest places. So, yeah, Bhagavatam is important. Nasta prayeshu abhadresha nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama sloke bhakti bhavati naistiki. By regular attendance in Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotees, all that is in the heart is practically, all ausp inauspiciousness that is in the heart is practically destroyed. And loving service unto the transcendent Lord is established as an irrevocable fact. Bhagavatam is a meditation. It is as good as Krishna. It is Krishna in transcendental sound. So Bhagavatam must be taken very seriously. We read it, we hear it. Uh, everything is there. The whole science and all the glories of Krishna are found in Bhagavatam. We want to get attached to reading Bhagavatam. We want to get attached to hearing Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is the best of all religious scriptures. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says, if they take all the books in the world and they burn it, and there's only Chaitanya Charitamrita left, there'll be no loss. And Bhakti Vinoda, of course, says if they take all the books in the, in the world and they throw it into the ocean and there's only Srimad Bhagavatam left, there's no loss. <laughs> so Bhagavatam is everything. It's the complete science of pure devotional service immersed with the glories of the Lord. Every page 
Every word, Prabhupada was walking with one German uh, professor, Professor Durkheim from Germany. And it was morning walk, and Prabhupada was talking, and they were. It was a really nice exchange. Professor Durkheim was very. He really liked Prabhupada. Prabhupada really liked him because the man was very learned and was asking good questions. So Prabhupada turned to Bhagavatam and was explaining Bhagavatam. Then he said, it takes um, one month to, to understand each verse of Bhagavatam. And then he turned to his disciples and he said, how long is that? <laughs> so 18,000 verses times one month. And somebody was really good and they said, that, that's 1,500 years, Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, you have enough to read. <laughs> In other words, it's a lifetime of study, just Bhagavatam alone, what to speak of the other scriptures we have. And this is a real treasure. So today we're glorifying uh, Vyasadeva because he put this Bhagavatam in print before it was only heard and spoken. Now it is in print for us. And Srila Prabhupada's purports have taken Bhagavatam to a, a even deeper understanding of this knowledge. So this is this. We can worship Bhagavatam. We can read it all day. And some there are many devotees. There's one devotee in our movement. He counted the pages in Bhagavatam, one sannyasi, it's Keshava Bharti Maharaj. And he counted the pages and he divided it by 365. So 365 days divided amount of pages comes to 41 pages a day. So if you read 41 pages a day for one year, you can finish the entire Bhagavatam. <laughs> like that. Now, 41 pages is it's a good chunk. <laughs> it's a good chunk. But this is, this is what devotees are doing to somehow or other read Bhagavatam, study Bhagavatam. They're making plans in different ways. So we can, uh, we can learn so much from Srimad Bhagavatam. We never get tired of Bhagavatam. So this great scripture has been given by Vyasadeva. Vyasadeva is an incarnation of Krishna. He's Shaktivesh. He's an empowered incarnation to bring religious scriptures to this age of Kali in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. So, today is his appearance day. It's called Guru Purnima. Sri Guru Purnima. Okay. It's not a fast day, so don't worry. <laughs> Any questions? I was with Keshava Bharati Maharaj for about 45 minutes in Mayapur last February, and it was just all about how he does that 41 pages a day. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't just read it, but he reads it out loud. He reads it out loud. Huh? Which is, makes it slower, you know, it's more time. Mm -hmm. But he said it's changed his life completely. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, it's, he feels so much more purified and actually I hadn't seen him in a few years and uh, just talking to him I mean he was a great soul anyway but he just seemed like even more saintly <laughs> amazing um, just one thing about Sanatan Goswami I always liked the part um, where you know there's four, four or five chapters in CC it's Sanatan Shiksha, Lord Chaitanya. So, chapter CC 1920, 21. Well, 19 Madhya. is Rupa. 19 is Rupa. Yeah, Rupa. It starts with 20. Right. So, 20. in chapter 20, text number 100, Sanatan mm -hmm. says, or Lord Chaitanya says, because Sanatan's asking uh, Lord Chaitanya questions, and then all of a sudden, Lord Chaitanya stops like a timeout. And he just starts marveling at Sanatan. And he says, Sanatan, you already know these things. But you're just inquiring for the sake of strictness. 
And so Prabhupada does not purport that, and it's like a mystery. What does Lord Chaitanya mean? Strictness. But luckily, when Prabhupada was in New York in he June... He gave class on that verse. Huh? He spoke on that. He spoke on it. Yeah, yeah. And he said, uh, he's, he, because strictness means that he wants to hear confirmation from superiors. So, that's great, you know. I just it's a that. principle we should follow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we shouldn't think we know. What's the, the four words that block learning? I already know that, right? <laughs> so we think we know, but actually Sanatan's asking things that he knows, that Lord Chaitanya, you already know this, but he wants to hear more and he wants, he wants his realizations confirmed, corroborated. Yeah. So you're right, it's a good lesson. Yeah, and when you do that, I mean, we, when we find, when we try to confirm something, we, le we generally learn more. We always get something else that we can add to the, whatever we already know. Even when you think you know, the confirmation brings out something else. It's also Krishna within the heart who inspires us to do that. And when we do that, Krishna gives us something else. Some, some added knowledge, some realization, something. Huh? Some depth, yeah. Yeah. Depth is really Krishna consciousness is about depth. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, take the microphone and, yeah. By Maharaj's mercy and Himangi Maharaji, I'm here and I'm here to teach seminars on Prabhupada uh, starting tonight at 6.45 to 8.15 will be lesson one and then we'll do two tomorrow and two Sunday and that'll be five and then we'll repeat the next weekend. Uh, Saturday and Sunday the times are 10.45 to 12.15 and 2.30 to 4 and it's a lot of fun. It's not dry, it's pure edutainment, I call it. It's educational, it's entertaining, and uh, every time I teach it, I learn something from the audience. So it's PowerPoint, it's interactive, it's question and answers. Please come, you'll get a lot out of it. It's called Srila Prabhupada, our founder, Acharya. The first lesson's interesting too, sets the stage. And Chitendri is pointing to the schedule there. Well, on the flyer, I read, it said, tonight is 6.45 to 8.15, and they're all 90 minutes. And then Saturday, Sunday, I read, because I was wondering uh, myself, and then I read in the fine print, it said uh, 10.45 to 12.15, and then 2.30 to 4. Maybe they changed it. Oh, 11 to 12.30? Okay, so maybe I, mis maybe I misread it, because that's the current. You can, con tonight you can reconfirm it after today. Yeah, hey, Mangi Mataji will, yeah. Thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, Sureshwar Prabhu has been doing this seminar for the last six years now? About six years all over the world. And uh, the GBC itself has approved of this lesson because it's foundational in understanding our role in relationship to Srila Prabhupada and, and who Srila Prabhupada is and what he came to give us. So um, it's really quite complete and it opens up a lot of interesting points that we probably would have never thought of before. So you'll definitely come across things you'll never heard before. So please come. And probably after that, there'll be prashadam. And if you don't come and you just come for prashadam, it doesn't taste as good. <laughs> it always tastes better after the lesson. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a hard guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> But anyway, I'm from the, we're from the old school. 
<laughs> okay, so please come and uh, it's a uh, best thing to do is come for RT at six and then stay for RT. Then that leads right into the class like that. Okay, Hare Krishna, Shila Sanatana Goswami ki, Shila Vyasa Dev ki, Guru Purnima ki, Chaturmasya ki, No Spinach ki. Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bo Srila Prabhupada Ki Your Guru Maharaj used to chastise me pretty heavy for that. Uh, if he finds out, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs>